let's talk about some cool things. Wasabi 2.0. Maybe it's worth going back and talk about the 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 history of of Bitcoin privacy and Wasabi and then see how Wasabi 2.2 fits into that. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think one thing to mention, right, just even before Bitcoin, were uh, digital cash systems like eCash, you know, where you have a centralized trusted third party. Uh, and that trusted third party verifies uh, the double spending uh, of transactions, right? So you verify the history and make sure that the money is valid. Um, and we can use clever cryptography tricks to make it in a way that the single trusted third party has very, very little information about the actual payments that's going on. And that's one of the attributes of Xiaomi and eCash. Um, but the big downside, of course, it's centralized and there's a single point of failure, right? So you can shut it down. Even though you have perfect privacy as a user, the system as a whole is still suspect to being shut down. Mm -hmm. And it's not just just shut down like uh, like a Bitcoin wallet company, but it's shut down like that money is, is over. That's <laughs> the end of that money, right? Yes. Everyone lost their money because it's shut down. Yeah, exactly. So it's quite critical. Um, and then I think the solution that Satoshi proposed with Bitcoin is <coughs> to distribute some aspects of what such a, a money issuer does. Right? So we have on one, um, writing a list of new transactions. Right. And then second is verifying that, that list, right? So only writing valid uh, transactions onto the list, in other words. Um, and in, in Bitcoin, these are two different kind of archetypes that keep the system running. And right? we have miners who produce blocks, which are additions to the list of transactions uh, that happened. And then miners uh, uh, and then full nodes verify if any block is correct uh, and according to their own rules. And then this means anyone can start mining, anyone can start writing new transactions to the block. Um, uh, and therefore, if any one person gets shut down and is being stopped from mining, well, there are still others. Right? So we have that. The censorship of uh, writing transactions is done. Um, but then, of course, the big problem of what is actually valid. Right? Here, again, every user as a merchant verifies every transaction that ever happened. Um, and this way we get uh, to a consensus, right? Where everyone agrees uh, on the same outcome of who has how much money. Uh, but the problem here is everyone needs to verify everything. And therefore a lot of people know a lot of information. Um, and it might be a bit counterintuitive of how to reduce the amount of knowledge that these verifiers actually have. Uh, and since this is such a radically new system, I think Satoshi did a lot of things right, but just a lot of the nuances of how to privately uh, verify something like this uh, were just too early. Uh, yeah, just to recap that uh, we started out with anonymous money has been invented a while ago, right? Um, it's questionable how well those constructions worked, but, but the technology was there. But we needed the money that cannot be shut down and that's when Satoshi came around, unfortunately. This, uh, the, he, he did it, it cannot be inflated and shut down, but unfortunately it, he had to compromise on the privacy mm -hmm. and it wasn't, it wasn't an easy decision for Satoshi. Yeah. But, uh, but anyway, so we have Bitcoin now. Um, what, can we, what can we tell about Bitcoin privacy? I think that, you know, privacy is the aspect to selectively reveal yourself to the world. And so we can go through what do you actually reveal when you receive Bitcoin and you send it. And right? so when you want to receive Bitcoin, basically you need to define a, a script, a, a condition uh, um, that must be fulfilled for that coin to be spent again. And right? so usually this is just a public key and you know the private key to it. But this can be something much more complex with multi-sig and time logs and all other stuff. Right? But so basically, first you need to reveal your script, oftentimes your public key. And then the other is, uh, well, how much Bitcoin do you want to get paid to onto this address? Right? So what's the amount of Satoshis that are protected by this address script? Um, and once you know how much money you want to receive, well, the money has to come from somewhere. And right? so there are some conditions that can be fulfilled here. Um, either you, you mine a new block, right? that's how you can get new units of coin, uh, or you spend the money that someone else has given you before. Right? So. Whenever you spend Bitcoin, that means you must reveal 
uh, where you got it before. Right? So there's this transaction history that is inherently linked in every Bitcoin transaction that you must reveal. Right? You cannot not reveal your Bitcoin transaction history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so, so that's how the blockchain works. And if we want to categorize the privacy of the blockchain privacy, then we would say that, hey, you have to protect the amounts and you have to protect the senders and the receivers. And, and, but there is another aspect to it, which is the network level privacy, right? And I think that's, that's something that finally brings, brings us to Wasabi here because, because, well, what's the problem with the network level privacy of like every single wallet except full nodes? They are leaking, leaking some kinds of information to some third party. Um, there are a couple of exceptions, like uh, Bitcoin Core Join Market, uh, all kinds of full node constructions, and also Breeze Wallet, mm -hmm. because they are using client side filtering, like Wasabi Wallet. So, Wasabi Wallet, another exception. But, oh, and there is Chain Case, which is a Wasabi fork. But other than that, every light wallet leaks your privacy in a very catastrophic manner. Mm -hmm. So yeah, to tie this into previously, right? So the, the Bitcoin system per se needs to function so that everyone verifies the trans every transaction that happened in the history of Bitcoin. Right? Only then can you yourself be sure um, that the entire money supply is accurate right? and, and not invalid. Uh, and the tricky thing is, right, whenever whenever you want to get paid, you actually need to scan the entire transaction history uh, to find out whether or not it includes an address of yours. Um, and now either you yourself uh, download all the blocks, verify all uh, the transactions, and then scan for uh, uh, your, your transaction history. Um, and the cool thing about Bitcoin is you can do it all by yourself. Right. That's that's the really beautiful thing. You you can verify how much money you've received without needing to trust anyone else. Um, however, running a Bitcoin full node is quite resource intensive. Right, a lot of CPU, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of storage, but that can be pruned, and especially a lot of bandwidth uh, as well. Right, so this is just heavy software, um, and not everyone can or wants to run that software. Uh, so what do you do? You just go to someone else who is running a full node uh, and basically give him your addresses and tell him, hey, how much money is on that address? Uh, and th that other block explorer uh, might respond with nothing, you're poor, <laughs> zero sats. Or it might be, look, uh, 10 Bitcoin uh, that you've received. Uh -huh. So I, I guess there is a question there that, um, okay, we, we talk about things, but where the store comes to the picture here, because that's important. Yeah. And 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 Tor doesn't really come into the picture that hey, if a wallet is using Tor, then it's not leaking your privacy. It's it's more important to use Tor. Tor is an anonymity network. It's more important to use Tor Tor properly. And mm -hmm. by by that, I mean properly as a as as a wallet developer has to use Tor properly, not the. Mm -hmm. The, the wallet users, they should not even know that Tor is there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they should know, but that's that's all, right? Yeah, and there's a lot of nuances here uh, because, well, if you use the ClearNet, uh, you have a uh, rather static public identity and right, your IP address. And that is linked to every query that you make, right? And so in one example, right, when, when you ask someone else how much money is on this address, uh, you can, if you have two addresses, you and you connect with your ClearNet IP address um, to that other person, he will know that this IP address wanted to know about the first address. And then five hours later, you come back and you give him the second address. Now he still sees, oh, that's the same IP address. Mm -hmm. right? The identity has not changed. So your your pseudonymous identity of IP address uh, is long lived in reputation, and therefore a lot of actions can be attributed to it. And now where Tor comes into the play. Uh, is with Tor, your ClearNet IP address does not directly connect to the destination, in our case, the, the Block Explorer. Right? But you connect to a couple other nodes first and you route your message through. Um, and so there's a large Tor network and you can build different routes uh, through the network from you to the destination. 
Um, and therefore, when so any one route that you use protects your IP address. And right? so your static identity is protected when you make different queries. Um, and that means that you can now just, uh, whenever you ask information from someone, you create a new Tor identity, build a new route through the Tor network to reach your destination. And, and when you do the next request, well, just a new Tor identity. And, and now, even though that other party still knows that someone is interested in this address, he can no longer link it to your IP address, and he can no longer link it to the same IP address or identity across different queries. Yeah, and and uh, I think let me let me start going back to the to the blockchain level privacy and and uh, and leave leave the network level privacy behind for now because what Wasabi 1.0 did with the network level privacy was that it's it's uh, it's it's so unappreciated because people don't even know it's there it's just it's just there right mm -hmm. and. And, and and that's that's when you you know you did something right in privacy when people don't even notice they just have it mm -hmm. and that's where we are going with the blockchain level privacy because wasabi 1.0 did not get the default blockchain level privacy experience mm -hmm. like like the default network level it did it it did not do for the blockchain level yeah. privacy what Wasabi 1.2 enabled was privacy on on Bitcoin with a light client, and this was the the innovation. Join market enabled privacy in Bitcoin. That that was the first theoretic theoretically sound privacy implementation, mm -hmm. and and now Wasabi came in, and. You want to talk about uh, Wasabi 1.0, zero link and stuff like that, or let's jump right into 2.0. Let's let's first recap one more thing about the the network level privacy, which Wasabi 1.0 did so well. Just as an example of of how it actually is, uh, you download Wasabi, you install it, you run it, and you're perfectly protected on the network level with Tor uh, and, and its nice implementation. Right? So there was basically zero interaction that needed to be done. Tor was nicely integrated by the developers, um, nicely designed, of course, by the pro uh, product developers themselves. And uh, the user, and it was on by default, right? So the user had zero actions other than installing the software uh, to do it well. The other extreme would have been, you know, you, you can download Wasabi, but then you need to download a second software, uh, Tor, uh, mm -hmm. And then you need to install Tor separately. Then you need to manually configure that Wasabi uses Tor, right? And uh, then maybe even worse, uh, you every time you want a new Tor circuit, a new Tor identity, you have to manually click that, right? So the, you know, every now and then again, a user manually clicks gets a new Tor identity. But in between the clicks, you have the same mm -hmm. static identity for everything, mm -hmm. right? And 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 clearly, you see, if if that were the case, um, users wouldn't do it as wouldn't behave as uh, sophisticated as the robot does. Right? Mm -hmm. The robot just generates a new ad a new Tor identity for basically everything. It would be like the user clicking, you know, twelve times a second, <laughs> and uh, there, that just makes it. Uh, yeah, it's good that something like this is is well thought through by the protocol developers, well implemented by the software developers, um, and then well configured. Uh, with the right private actions done by default so that the user um, ha doesn't have to worry about a lot of the complex uh, things. And there's way less reasons or, or um, surprises that could, happen, that could have happened when he shoots himself in the foot. And, and may I say that that's what exactly what we are going for with Wasabi 2.0? Mm -hmm. Because, well, because privacy should be just there. Right and shouldn't be, we shouldn't have to like do all kinds of ceremonies on the user interface that 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 makes it happen. So it's not, it's not not that easy task as someone would would think. Um, probably no one thinks it right now about coin joins, but but Tor integration and. And client site filtering and these kind of things. Probably a lot of people think that these are like, like so easy because it was done so well. But 
it's 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 not <laughs> <laughs> it's Tor is unreliable you have to catch uh, impossible exceptions and handle them differently and hack around all kinds of network issues so so it's a uh, that's why it's difficult to find an application that works properly over Tor like Wasabi or Tor Browser. And even Wasabi doesn't work properly yet in the sense that there's just a lot of cases where Tor doesn't run or you yeah. sometimes need to restart or it's just super slow. I, you know, I, I do think it's, it's, uh, it's our, our problem as yeah. developers. We, we notice it because but I don't think the normal user ever encounters maybe one yeah. percent of them with, with Wasabi. I don't think they encounter Tor issues. And to be fair, this is one of the things that we have improved a lot during the 1.0 lifecycle, right? We have a solid Tor implementation with the 1.0 initial release. But now if you compare it with 1.1.13 or where we're at, it's just mountains ahead uh, and, and way superior in, in many forms. So it got a lot more stable. Um, and I think just in general, right, this was kind of our maybe philosophy with 1.0. Uh, we had something that was pretty great um, in, in a lot of regards, um, but or and we can improve it marginally, some little tweaks, you know, we can make Tor more reliant. Um, we could, for example, load multiple wallets, you know, small improvements to the, to the wallet architecture itself. And that sustained us with, what, two or three years of, of development time uh, just to marginally improve the software step by step. Um, but then ultimately, I think we realized that if we want to make a another leaps and bound forward in uh, terms of privacy by default, we really need to um, solve some some issues or some design constraints and reorganize and optimize. Um, and that was the Wasabi 2.0 process. Uh, it's somewhat of a reimagining a Bitcoin wallet from scratch. Yeah, it, it is, but it wasn't really necessary, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a, a good story. So, so for, for the for the coin join, of course, it was necessary mm -hmm. because we were replacing the, the, the coin join algorithm. We started the research in 2019 and 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 then we we look through every single privacy technologies. Those are has been created for Bitcoin, and then we we figured out what we can do the best, and we did it, and and now we are here. But for the UI part, we did not need to do that. It's mm -hmm. um, it's um, there are other things in the background, you know, because we have. <laughs> We have an interesting, interesting, unique, unique uh, advantage regarding user experience and UI development uh, because our, we have a number of maintainers of the UI framework that, that, uh, that Wasabi is using. Right, no software can even dream of having a single maintainer of uh, of mm -hmm. the UI framework that they are using, but we do, and and that's uh, that's something. But that also comes with responsibility. Oh, the name of the UI framework is Avalonia, and the responsibility is that we have to actually build the best UI because because Wasabi is the the, the golden child of Avalonia. It's, it's, it's what's showcasing the power of the Avalonia framework. So the UI people came to, to, to us that they would like to rewrite the Wasabi 1.0 UI from the bottom up because they want to like, well, showcase Avalonia. And, and that's how the, the, the UI mm -hmm. refactoring started. Yeah but it wasn't strictly necessary. Mm -hmm. But I, I think still, nevertheless, it was a good thing because we had this kind of feature creep with the 1.0 UI as well. Right? It started mm -hmm. out uh, pretty simple, uh, pretty clean uh, and nice. But then as more and more and more features got added, mainly because I requested them, so sorry about that. <laughs> but it uh, it just got... I, I implemented them. So <laughs> <laughs> it's not only your fault. <laughs> But, but yes, it just got um, 
cluttered, I think. And um, there, we, we could have gone even more down that road, you know, turn it into somewhat like a, a, almost like a, like a coding developing environment, you know, buttons everywhere, like GIMP, you know, can do everything and all, all the things, but it uh, takes a long time to get used to it. Once you get used to it, you can fly through like a wizard, right? But the first initial user experience is just horrible. Um, and even ongoingly, just a lot of things that could be nicer. Um, and well, either we, you know, could some could continue some marginal refactoring here and there, remove some UI concepts, replace them in the old framework. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, what you get when you refactor something from scratch is that um, you can make a lot of the decisions again, uh, and you can be more um, ruthless in cutting things out. Mm -hmm. I think uh, because well, you need to build everything from scratch, so only build the stuff that's good, you know, and the things that we know that don't work from the past, we don't need to inherit those mistakes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, hmm. there is a lot to talk about the UI on the coin join, but maybe. I, I, I think um, that the entire coin join UX is one of the things that uh, were really not as good as they could have been with Wasabi 1.0. Right, so network level privacy just works by default for everyone. Great, but how is that with blockchain level privacy? Right, so you you download Wasabi, you install it, uh, wallet is empty, of course, uh, and then you receive some Bitcoin into your wallet. Right, great. Um, that was already a one user interaction. Right, you needed to generate an address and get paid. Mm -hmm. But then what? Right, by by default, nothing. Um, there there is a indicator on, in the coin list, you know, with a red shield. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe this is 1.2. This is 1.0, yes, yes. So, and, and maybe that looks scary, right? I don't know, but maybe the red shield is supposed to be there. Right? Um, so the user doesn't really know what to do. He, he might have a slight indication that there is a problem because there's a red shield, but he, he's not even sure what's the solution to that problem. Right? He, he needs to click on a complete different tab that's called coin join. What, what is a coin join? I don't know. <laughs> and and uh, why does that solve my solution with the shield? You know, so there's a lot of guesswork that needs to be done of what's the problem mm -hmm. and how can this tool help me solve the problem. And, and then sure, eventually you figure it out. Okay, I need to you know, select that red coin and enqueue it and wait and magic happens, right? So um, where, where, of course, the, the period of the coin join itself, you know, all the input registration phase, output registration phase, signing phase, all of this is magically happening in the background, right? Of course, there the user doesn't have to manually sign messages and stuff. Um, but the act of choosing when to coin join, uh, which coins to coin join, um, and uh, things like this are all left up to the user. Uh, and those are very difficult choices that even people who know a whole bunch about Bitcoin might do wrong. Right? But on the other hand, there is a lot of responsibility with it because this is actual money, right? And your, your wallet is there to spend money. And so, um, we, we always want to make sure that we actually have the user um, consent uh, for all the activity that we do, because if we don't have it, well, arguably the wallet is stealing from the user. Well, I guess it's a good time to introduce the UI concept that we figured out for the coin joins. We, we started with the, well, with the goal that we have to put the coin joins into the background, right? Because like, that's how privacy works. Preferably, users don't even shouldn't even have to know that coin journeys are happening. But but the user has to know it because because it's actually taking money away from them. So, but it doesn't have to be overly pushed into their faces. So, do we have something that that is that is that is okay if we have it in the background? And it doesn't really interfere with what we are doing. And that's some music. That's the background music. And what we figured is that coin joins are like background music. And, and the idea here is that everyone is familiar with the, with the play, pause and stop buttons of a music box of a media player and and, and so, so we can actually have our coin join denoted in a way that it's, it, it would be like, like background music of the application. Mm -hmm. 
and and uh, and it's pretty cool. The implementation is pretty cool. Uh, is it going to work? Probably, but it's up for the users. <laughs> Yeah, this uh, this is I think where a lot of interesting ideas came came in um, because there are not that many wallets implementing coin join things, and uh, there's no really nice UI uh, for uh, or you know UX best practices for these types of things. This is you know recklessly new, um, and we are starting with a blank page, right? and that's that's difficult because there are so many options um, and. Uh, Curating all those possible options into a couple good ones, and then uh, improving those and finding a, a, a really nice metaphor that works for users um, to convey intuitively uh, what's going on, um, without uh, and and why it's useful that it's going on, and right? uh, without knowing much about the details, um, and that's that's difficult. Right? Because you, you don't want to expose too much complexity because that's just too confusing. But you also don't want to remove all the information because then you don't have uh, you know, informed consent and decision making from the user. And it's like you know, Tor browser. They have uh, the different modes, right? Safers, safest, and safest test or something. <laughs> um, but here the, the difference is that you, you, you pay with a little bit of uh, convenience, right? A website might take a second longer to load. Um, maybe some images will be not loading or you know JavaScript and whatnot. Um, but ultimately, that's just you waiting. Right? It's not you making a payment um, and you spending money. Um, it's, it's different. Well, you know, since you started going into the different modes, then, then uh, I think we can talk about the different modes that we have, the different... <sighs> What 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 did we even call it? Coin join profile, I believe, or coin join modes. <laughs> yeah, in the code, but not in the in the UI. In the UI, it's it's something like coin join strategy. Ah, yes, strategy. Yes. Um, so so okay, we we have coin join running in the background like a background music, but whenever someone creates a wallet. He actually has to select between three different strategies, which they can customize if they want. But he has to select between three different strategies. And one would be to optimize for costs. One would be to optimize for uh, speed. And one would be to optimize for privacy. And, and yeah, I think people can make, make, make their trade-offs. This mm -hmm. can make, make, Coin joins. This 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 might have a large large impact in 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 terms of coin join usage. It yeah I yeah because everyone wants to 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 optimize for for something else. Exactly right. So so in Wasabi 1.0, the user had the choice of when to coin join, how much to coin join. Now the robot gets to make the decision when to coin join, which coins to coin join. Um, and, and what amounts to coin join, and that's that's super difficult because again we're spending money, and that's always a subjective uh, value preference, especially in the privacy realm. Right? You have different uh, privacy threat vectors and um, different layers of defense that you would want to build up, um, and so there are you know scenarios completely different. There might be a user who buys his Bitcoin on an exchange, maybe on BISC. Um, and then he wants to put it into his hardware wallet privately, and right, so that he has his long-term holdings that he won't touch for you know five happenings. Um, then, then you don't care how how long the ceremony takes, right? If it takes you a day or, or a week or a month, it doesn't matter. Um, but you probably want to have a cheap, and uh, since you're not making an actual payment, you're just saving your wealth, right? Uh -huh. Oh, I, I think it's worth mentioning that what what is optimizing for cost means, uh, because. What we can do is that, well, the Bitcoin Bitcoin mempool is often getting full and emptying out, and and based on that, we either pay more or less fees for for transactions. So what we can do with that is that we can have some averages or medians uh, where where like hey. The last week's median's fee rate was five satoshi per byte, 
and then we could say that okay only mix when the fee rate is under five satoshi per, per byte and in that way it will take twice as long but on the other hand it's going to be cheaper yeah yes that's that's interesting so this is basically a way to take out the the spikes in in the mempool and in the current fee rate mm -hmm. right so if if uh, all of a sudden many new transactions get broadcast uh, then uh, the wasabi coordinator is going to increase the fee rate that's being paid um, for this current coin join um, and well maybe the client says now this this is quite a high fee rate in in the past over the last one week or one month um, the, the fee rate was much lower, so I'm hoping that it will go down quickly in the in the near time future, and I will only coin join then. And so this is one of the ways, um, yeah, that the that the robot is manipulated in a sense, right? So how how do you choose when to coin join? Uh, this is one of the factors that that is considered in Wasabi. So so let let me think. There are so many things about Wasabi coin joins, Wabi Sabi, Wasabi 2.0 coin joins. Those are different. And I'm probably we're gonna miss out like three very important points from this this uh, conversation. But maybe let's start talking about that. What do you say? Mm, yes, and maybe let's talk about why we why it would be difficult to do what we do now especially auto coin join with our current um, zero link setup why, why do you think why, why were we even looking to change our coin join coordination protocol there are some some edge cases but I, I wouldn't say those matter uh, yeah I think it could be done with the current one too so why didn't we oh because of time mm -hmm. it was always planned right I think the crucial difference is that in zero link, um, by the design of the protocol, you only get privacy for those coins where you have um, a, a equal amount to other people. Right? So your outputs you need to have exactly the same amount um, of satoshis in order for you to be able to talk to the coordinator in a private way. And so um, for those outputs that don't have uh, the same uh, denomination as other coins, the coordinator can link these to your inputs, uh, basically. So um, this is a, a way where when you actually talk to the coordinator in, in the preparation of a new coin join transaction, right, where your privacy is, is restricted. So you need to reveal more to the coordinator um, for those non-standard denominations. Let, let, let me just clarify something because I've seen it misinterpreted on the internet before that when when we're talking about that with, with, with Wasabi 1.2 we have to every input that you're registering into a coin join are merged together and the outputs are also somewhat interlinked. Um, these are not these are not privacy leaks in Wasabi 1.0. These are limitations on how you can organize your outputs in order to keep it private, mm -hmm. right? So now we removed these limitations and now we can do a lot more ways of organizing outputs. So, so that's the, that's the 2.0 research basically mm -hmm. all about this. Oh, and very important because we're going to forget it that <laughs> that with 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 two point oh there is no zero point one bitcoin uh, uh, minimum denomination. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, yeah. There yeah. is no such a thing. <laughs> Fine. So there uh, there were a lot of a lot of things implicitly assumed in our original Wasabi one point oh implementation, right? So we have the zero link uh, coordination protocol, which means um, you you are required to have standard denominations. Um, in to get communicational privacy, uh, but then there was also, um, you know, that that you just that there's only one standard denomination pool, right? So at, at the beginning there was only the zero point one pool, 
So if you put one Bitcoin in, you get 0.1 private and 0.9 not private. And so every user can only get one coin out of the out of the standard denomination. Um, and, and you cannot get multiples, right? So this means if you have a large amount of Bitcoin, it will take you a long time to, to break this down into actual private coins. Um, and this is where that concept of, of the change came, right? Um, and then later, we uh, tried to improve that by adding more denomination pools into the same coin join um, so that people get more coins, not just the one 0.1 plus change, but you get the 0.1 private coin. And then there's also 0.2 and or 0.4 and the 0.8 and so on. Um, so that means that those who have more Bitcoin get more coins, but more of them are private, right? So a larger sum of your Satoshis is in more private coins. Mm -hmm. um, but but here, another kind of implicit assumption w was that we, everyone, still everyone has to get the 0 0.1 coin. Right? And only if you have more money can you get the 0 0.2 coin. And then only if you have more money can you get the 0 0.4. So there was no way to only get a, z a single 0 0.8 coin. Um, that, that wasn't possible um, in, in the way it was implemented. Um, again, that wasn't really a limitation in, in zero link. Right? Yeah, it, it could, have been, it, could have been implemented that way. Yes. Yeah. Um, and well, what does that mean? If, if we, this is kind of, we decompose from the bottom up, right? So everyone gets the 0 0.1 and then whoever has more money gets the next one and so on. Um, that means that if you have a lot of money, you always have to get a 0 0.1 coin in every coin joint transaction, right? And only then a 0 0.2. So you will get, again, more coins uh, as, as otherwise. Mm -hmm. And for the, for the, which means more fees, right? Arguably, if you have more money, you're happier to pay a bit more in fees, but that's a not fitting assumption. Um, and then if you are a, a small guy, right? if you have less than 0 0.1, you're just out of the picture, right? Because that was the minimum that every user had to have. Um, so, you know, that just leaves you out if you only have a million sets. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other, th but if you have more than 0.1, right, then you get a great amount of privacy because all the people who are, who have small amounts of Bitcoin, 0.1 or 0.2, they are in your anonymity set of the 0 0.1. And those whales too, right? Someone coming in with 100 Bitcoin is still going to get a 0.1 output. So he's still benefiting you, right? Um, so, this just means we maximize the anonymity set for our smallest denomination, the 0 0.1, right? That's where we had up to 100 uh, denominations uh, or 100 um, outputs. Um, but for the larger values, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, right? And this is quite inefficient, right? We create many outputs with small values and fewer outputs with larger values, mm -hmm. right? So we consume more block space. That's more expensive. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's not just more, but it's a lot more, right? Yes. Like, it's uh, we're not quite sure how how much more it is because we have to see it working in real life. But yeah. it's somewhere between ten to a hundred order of magnitude improvements in terms yeah. of block space efficiency. And, so, and especially when when you have a lot of Bitcoin, right? So let's yeah. assume you have a hundred Bitcoin in Wasabi one point oh, you end up with probably around 95 coins worth 0 0.1, uh, sorry, 950 mm -hmm. coins worth 0 and 1, and then another maybe 800 coins that are change. And um, uh, so this, 80. if you have 100 Bitcoin, no, it gets break down to 1000 times 0 0.1 Bitcoin. Ah, and oh, then yes, you have 1000 yes, change yes, coins yes, as well. Yes, yes. Right, so you end up with roughly, roughly 2000 yeah. coins. That's kind of ridiculous, you know. Um, and so, in our in our new way to um, so so what changes basically that that you can decompose from the top down, mm -hmm. and so you don't have to be in a in the point one pool, right? Um, you and you can have multiple of the same denominations, and right? so I can have two times a uh, zero point five Bitcoin output, um, and then. Uh, um, yeah, I can. I don't have to go from the bottom all the way, right? It's not. You can only be part of the point two if you are in the part point one already. So mm -hmm. you can be in the point one, in the point seven, in the one point six, right? So you don't need to fill up all of these just to proceed to the next stage, uh, and that's just so much more efficient. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure what would happen if you have a hundred Bitcoin and mix that. How many coins would you end up with? 
that's an interesting thing, but it's for sure going to be less than 2000. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm not quite sure how this will will behave. Well, it, it depends on the second largest inputs mm-hmm. of the rounds that it's participating with. Yeah, exactly. I think this should be should be fine. We'll see. <laughs> right, and, and in Mitilov's company. Uh, so if, if you're a whale with you know a thousand Bitcoin and you're swimming in a pool where others have between 0.1 and 0.5, Mm-hmm. Well, you know, <laughs> it's going to be either very, very expensive for you to create a whole bunch of small outputs. Uh, and even then, you know, most of these small outputs that were created belong to you and everyone knows that. Um, so that's that just makes it extremely difficult. Um, and so whenever we talk about, uh, you know, larger users, um, they only get sufficient privacy if there are other large users available. And the more other large users available, and especially that gap between the largest and the second largest user, um, th- that's an important one, right? Yeah, and yes, because okay, so you can. Th- there were people who put a thousand Bitcoin into Wasabi wallet, right? Mm-hmm. And it didn't work for them mm-hmm. because, in order to anonymize a thousand Bitcoin, there should be at least. 10, 10 times more people to uh, like bitcoins to to actually to, to do something and it's it's just not not cut out of for that so yeah. it's uh, you cannot hide an elephant with in in between chickens right mm. <laughs> yeah and this is a this is a very inherent thing to to most privacy concepts right the size of the crowd. Um, you know, that's why Tor is so successful, because a whole bunch of people use Tor. Mm-hmm. And so, so you're in a room with many other people. Um, and, you know, this is why uh, especially opt-in uh, privacy features are difficult, because most people go with the defaults, and then only few people opt in. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we see that already on the macro scale in Bitcoin. Right? It's not mandatory that users make a coin join, for example, for every blockchain transaction. So it's an opt-in thing, and therefore we see the percentage of coin join transaction compared to non-coin join transactions, you know, dwindling. So it's so quite a small. Um, um, do we see that? Or what? Um, I, I mean, uh, assuming we can fingerprint coin joins correctly, right? We can just see how much block space is used in coin join transactions versus how much block space is used in single user transactions. Okay. Um, and then we see a percentage. To be honest, I don't know what that number is, but I would be surprised if it's like maybe ten percent. I think the important question here is that how much more do one user and one coin join user, mm-hmm. one non coin join user and one coin join user, and how much more that will will cost? And uh, the problem is that we cannot even. Um, measure it because it depends on so many things the network fees the uh, amounts mm-hmm. uh, being used uh, like yeah so it's not not quite sure but it's it's much much smaller than than uh, wasabi 1.2 mm-hmm. yeah it, yes that that surely and we really need to work on the uh, block space savings First and foremost, I think, uh, or, or not first and first and first yeah. and foremost, but it's yes. it's a, yes. a huge, a huge design constraint. Yeah, because the the most private option would be we create uh, a huge amount of one satoshi outputs, and uh, we just break so, it down to the very smallest denominator. Same strategy we used in Wasabi 1.0, where the smallest was 0.1. Just go all the way out. But of course, the problem is then you have a whole bunch of public keys and outputs on the blockchain. Well, wait, wait. I mean, I. Uh, I'm not sure it's important to work on that because it, it might be, but I'm not sure we can. I think we are chasing diminishing returns mm-hmm. here, and may, maybe the maybe the next step is like a lot of work. Okay, this was Wasabi Wallet. This is how much work it was, and this is how how much it bloated the blockchain. Okay, mm-hmm. then we had. Wasabi Wallet 2.0, which is like a lot more work than Wasabi Wallet 1.0, and we just 
string we don't bloat the blockchain that much anymore we just bloat it like this much okay so and now how much can we improve maybe we have to do a lot of work to improve a little bit on the block space efficiency I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure but now I have questions if we can do do meaningfully better mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I th like in. I, I do think that this was a massive jump forward in block in terms of block space efficiency. Um, but if it already is has reached a plateau point, I'm not sure, because yeah. we're still super early in in learning more about uh, mm -hmm. about Isabi style transaction graphs and and what that actually means in the wild. I mean, sure, we can make simulations mm -hmm. based on. Basabi 1.0 coin join volumes and things like this, but um, it, it's super difficult to anticipate how that will be used in the wild on mainnet. Um, and I, I'm confident that we have not yet found the most optimal solution, <laughs> but I'm, I'm confident that it is a whole bunch better than 1.0, like many orders of magnitudes. And that's, that's good enough for now. And, uh, and I think now we are in the next stage of making small marginal improvements that mm -hmm. do still sum up mm -hmm. because we're not yet at the plateau, right? We have mm -hmm. a couple more years of yeah. work to do before we are at a point where it's such diminishing small returns. I probably would work on mobile wallet if, <laughs> if we, we, but well, you know, uh, the feature that we just talked about in the beginning about the cost saving to only save the better part of the week. I mean, that's quite, quite creative. And I think there are like, I don't know, five more that kinds of tricks we can pull out. But, but uh, yes, yeah, anyway. I actually think like, sure, we could reduce the general footprint of all Wasabi users in general. There's a lot of things that we can do like that. But I think where it's going to be more important and more meaningful of an impact is to um, fine tune the experience for the individual user. And right? so uh, because, you know, as we said earlier, they're so different user groups and they have different preferences, especially in terms of cost. You know, some are hardcore one set per V-byte maximalists that will die on that hill, right? Um, and while well, some, you know, are happy to overpay 10x on fees just for the shits and giggles. Um, so I think to, to somehow fine tune uh, our auto coin join behavior so that these... I think we already have that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a good first step, right? For, for sure. Like it, there is something there already and that will make a meaningful impact in the behavior of uh, and the results of, of the users choosing the different profiles, right? But but I think still um, there is a lot of room to make that more nuanced and fine grained so that we can catch a more more variety of different user groups uh, because there is a lot of diversity in the Bitcoin user space um, and you know we need to walk a fine line um, between shipping something that is that gives sufficient uh, like that's that does what the users want, right? But then also having something that is high anonymity set and where where no single user can be fingerprinted, right? So there's there's kind of this fine line between giving flexibility while still staying in the same anonymity set. Right. Well, look, there are a lot of wallets those are giving flexibility, like Electrum or Spectre, but. On the one hand, like creating privacy is hard enough yeah. and maybe we should just do one thing and do that very well and then try to spread it to more and more people by creating uh, hardware wallet integrations, uh, mobile wallet, um, localization and, and this kind of stuff. I think that would make a bigger impact than trying to add the small features for mm -hmm. all kinds of uh, um, technical niche customers. Uh, that's so you caught me again trying to slip in those nasty features uh, to bloat the whole UX. <laughs> <laughs> I will keep trying. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, but it's. it's uh -huh. 
it, it's tricky. Like this, this is really the core of it, right? Um, how much does it even need to be fine tuned? How much does that make a meaningful impact? How much does that improve uh, user satisfaction and, and the usefulness of Wasabi? Um, versus how much does it increase the complexity and the confusion and the foot guns, especially the foot guns, I think. Um, it's not easy. One interesting concept is that um, now the coin join, when activated, happens by default in the background um, and mixes the, the entire wallet. Right? Um, that's a big change in the UX where previously, again, the user had to choose when to coin join and which coins to coin join. How do you think that will, will make an impact? So, I think, I think the basic idea is, is, is obviously the future that, hey, you have a wallet that's private and, 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 and that, that's it. It just works for you. Now, it doesn't mix all the time but, and, and most of the times, <laughs> right? It tries to figure out when you are not messing around with the wallet, like, you're not on the stand tub or after opening the wallet, it waits for a random amount to start the mixing. And when you click on close, then we are actually going to the background and we are doing the stuff in, in the background. So, so, so it's very smart, but, um, but, but yeah, generally that, that is obviously the future, right? If we don't have a, if we don't have a money that we can just receive and send and knowing that our privacy is taken care of, then, then, then we did not succeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think so too. Um, and, but just to highlight again, because it is the default, it needs to be very efficient, right? Um, because of the cost that the default soft use of the software will bring, right? But, if we can design a coin join experience that is efficient enough um, to not be outrageously expensive in terms of block space, then hopefully more and more users will will be happy uh, with that behavior, right? And this is just again one of the, or I guess the most crucial part why we went so hard after block space efficiency in the Wabi Sabi research um, was because if we make it the default, we need to make it um, reasonably uh, mm. efficient. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's um, it's a good point. And I really wonder then also what that does for for the total anonymity set size, right? And and the total number of, of users coin joining because you know whereas previously there was a, a stark difference between uh, <laughs> we will never know. <laughs> That's the other thing. <laughs> yes, because we don't know how many users are participating. There are no concept of user anymore in Wasabi. It's only inputs and outputs and no one has any idea how many people are participating in that. So yeah, it's, it's we fun. will never know. <laughs> it's funny, even when looking at, at, you know, one of those small coin joints on Tesla, it's like, so I, I know I was a part of that run. I, I think someone else, but maybe a third, maybe a fourth. <laughs> yeah. Is it maybe 11 people? I don't know. It's, 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 it's fun, you know. Um, yeah, right. Auto coin join and, and how that affects uh, liquidity. Because you know, again, previously we had Wasabi users who just loved the default Tor integration, right? The block filtering, the coin selection, all of these things. And these people might not even have done coin joins much, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then those people who, who do coin joins might not even do their entire wallet, right? Or um, might only once a month or something activate coin join, um, and. This just means that we have, you know, we have more available users online currently than that are registered in CoinJoin, mm -hmm. right? So not everyone is registered in, in CoinJoin or, or even interested in CoinJoin or, or checking what the rates are and stuff like this. Um, whereas with 2.0, of course, you can turn off the auto CoinJoin functionality. Um, but when you do turn it on, uh, the wallet just stays open and continuously checks for opportune rounds happening at the coordinator. Um, and just when you start Wasabi, you will be looking uh, to participate in coin joins most of the time. Um, and 
that's just different, you know. This and I think this will have such a big impact on on liquidity too, right? Because as soon as people as people are in line, they're they're more uh, ready to coin join, um, mm-hmm. and this will hopefully lead not just to higher anonymity set sizes, but arguably more importantly uh, to a faster coin join ceremony per se, right? Um, whereas in the very beginning of Wasabi 1.0, you know, a coin join every two weeks. Um, then eventually a coin join a day, uh, and now we're at a coin join an hour. Well, if we implement something like auto coin join, and now more of the online users become active in the coin join liquidity pool, um, that just I think will will hopefully mean that we can have a coin join every ten minutes, five minutes. You know, maybe if if it goes crazy, a coin join every minute. And and how does that change the user experience, right? Whereas whereas previously. Again, if you had like 10 Bitcoin, you needed to wait a week or something mm. or even longer, right, to, yeah, yeah. to get sufficient privacy. Yeah. All of a sudden now, you still have a large amount, but it's done in, you know, half an hour. Um, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> half an hour. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, if we have such liquidity, then it's possible now. You know, I, I think it's one thing we, want, we should notice because it comes up a lot that... Um, Auto coin join for for the users who already have Wasabi wallets. There is no auto coin join. They can turn it on, but by default, it's not going to auto coin join, right? It, it just highlight it's not that all Wasabi users don't have it, right? So you have an old existing wallet mm-hmm. uh, that you've generated in Wasabi 1.0. Uh, soon you will see a oh, yeah. notification you, update You don't available. have to migrate. That's yes. also something that comes exactly. up all the time. So on the old GUI, you will just see new update available. Same way as you've downloaded and installed yeah, it before. Exactly, like every single update that yeah. we did. Your wallet is still there, still knows how much money you have. All your old labels are kept. And you can keep using the old GUI. Just the coin join is going to be like run out of people. Yes. <laughs> Uh, and again, right, that's a crucial thing. There are here two different coordinators that will for a time run in parallel, right? We have the zero link coordinator that you know and love already now, and that will be available at least for some time uh, after what we release 2.0. Um, but then all those users who download the 2.0 software will no longer connect to the zero link coordinator, but to the new uh, coordinator, speaking the Wabi Sabi protocol. Um, and well, that just means whoever upgrades is in the new pool and he leaves the old pool, right? And whoever did not upgrade will stay in zero link pool. Um, mm-hmm. And hopefully more and more people upgrade as time passes, because the software is good. Hopefully few people downgrade. <laughs> um, but yeah, then, then we will see how, how this behaves over time. So one of the big benefits of the results of Wasabi 2.0 is going to be that in almost or very few cases do you receive change in your coin join, and so uh, basically all your uh, input value will uh, get great or will result in a uh, coin with at least some ambiguity, with at least some anonymity set. Yes, with one caveat: that's what our simulations show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's important because. It doesn't start working like that only from 50 or 100 inputs. And we cannot actually test that on testnet because, I mean, we can, but it's like we cannot really simulate like real Bitcoin wallets on testnet. So so there is still, still some question, but it's very, very encouraging. Yes, and I think that um, because it's because we don't have many users on testnet, we don't really have high anonymity set, right? So even though developers run a couple of clients on testnet, uh, it's still quite little. And then we see transactions with maybe 30 inputs, right? Maybe 50 at most, but more like between 15 and 30 inputs. And um, there, the, the end result is mm, uh, not just as nuanced as it will get when uh, there are more inputs, right? So, but how did you go about then building an actual simulation? Um, that it was not on testnet uh, to to make more reasonable decisions about this. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It's um, well, uh, it it happened like almost one or one and a half a year ago, so I don't remember exactly <laughs> <laughs> what what was the simulation. But the idea was that you could get a lot of 
inputs into it and and okay so, so imagine a function this is the the amount the composition function mm. you get all the inputs of the coin join and you get you know which ones are your inputs and now so you have all the inputs and your inputs and now you want to create outputs those don't re result in change at the end without knowing what the other people's outputs are on, 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 on the client side, right? This is happening on the client side. So, so built this simulation um, and, 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 and it's some um, uh, coin join analyzer techno technique and, and, I, and I had a big, big uh, console output and, and, and based on the technique we uh, and we started then changing the algorithm, the coin join algorithm. We started out with Wasabi 1.2 and we figured, okay, so how can we make the results of our simulation better than the result was for, coin, for Wasabi 1.2? And we made one change. Uh, one of the major change that we did, that with Wasabi 1.2, we have powers of two denominations. So, because it's like 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 04, 0, 08, and 1.6 Bitcoin, those are the denominations in Wasabi 1.2. But now we introduced a lot more denomination systems. Um, I did not actually expect myself that we are going to introduce a lot more, but it seemed like, hey, we are just adding another one and it still gave better results. Mm -hmm. And after that, we, we were adding more, but we, we found about five that, that gives the most block space efficient, changeless, uh, changeless um, output decomposition. So these are powers of two, powers of three, powers of three multiplied by two, one, two, five series. It's the preferred value series and powers of 10. Sorry. Yes, that's the, that's the five. Mm -hmm. And, and, and okay. Now that's a lot of number. This generates a lot of number because start from one Satoshi, two Satoshi's powers of two. So yes, three Satoshi powers of three. So yes, four Satoshi powers of two. So yes, uh, five Satoshi is one to five series. So, so, so. So it generates a lot of uh, denominations and, and and now the question is that um, so so how do you how do you actually choose which denominations you're going to participate with in the round? Okay, so you want those denominations to be to, to actually other people to choose those denominations too. But we don't know who are the other people in the input side. We know all the inputs, but we don't know the, the people. So what we can do is at first approximation say that, okay, so one input, let's make that, that one, uh, one, one person. Let's, let's have that assumption. And we're just going to create a frequency table, break down every single input one by one and create a frequency table out of that. Uh, that frequency table is going to say that uh, four Bitcoin appeared in our breakdown three times. Uh, eight Bitcoin appeared in our breakdown as a denomination two times. And 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 this way you can actually figure out which which um, well which denominations are are likely to to be used in that round and other people figure out the same frequency table as you so everyone is going to basically agree on the same denominations because uh, so this is how it it uh, it's happening and and then you break down your input sum to the denominations that you get out from the frequency table. And yeah, the, the question is, how do you break it down? 
we we have some strategies. Uh, there's some randomization in that, but 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 gives good good uh, good results for the for the simulations. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. So, so to to summarize that a bit, right? We first of all we we need to know some uh, uh, input values, uh, and the uh, the question is, well, which do we choose? Right? That's the simulation. Um, so we took the best real-world approximation that we had, which was the existing fresh Bitcoin uh, <coughs> that were registered to Wasabi Zero-Link coin joins. Um, and so fresh Bitcoin are those Bitcoin that have not previously been in a coin join, right? uh, and they were then spent on the input side of a coin join transaction. Um, and uh, so these are hopefully reasonable values that we can expect to see in the future too because it was just real people depositing money into their Wasabi wallets, right? So maybe people deposited because they knew there was the 0.1 denomination. So maybe there's some ambiguity here that will change, but roughly that's, that's reasonable, right? Um, and then we choose randomly some of those inputs uh, or input values, because here in the simulation, we just care about values, right? This is about amount uh, organization or amount decomposition. And so this is purely numbers, right? So we take the numbers of Satoshis of those randomly selected inputs. Um, and these are the current uh, coins that are registered in the current round of coin join in our simulation. And, and now we, uh, the problem though is not even the coordinator knows which user controls which inputs, right? Contrarily to zero link. Uh, in Wabi Sabi, the coordinator and other users just see inputs popping up, but they don't know which user controls one or multiple of the inputs. And, it's, uh, um, and so there could be different approaches of how we now decompose this, right? What, what you mentioned is we just assume that one user only owns m one coin. Right? And, um, but one, an, uh, another approach would be to select, a, let's say, on average between two to three coins per user, between two to five coins per user. Uh, and you just assign some random user group to, to this list of coins. The, the assumption that one input is one user and the assumption is that, that this two input is one user, is that the first one that I, if I pick one input, the likelihood that it is one user is, let's say, 30%, I don't know, 10%, uh, let's say 10%. But if I pick any two inputs, the likelihood goes down to 1%. So, so that's why it's better to operate with only one single input rather than, than, than multiple input groups. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference in, in like how many outputs uh, you would choose here, right? Because if, if we assume that one user controls one output, then um, you, you don't consolidate, right? Then every user fans out because he creates one or more mm -hmm. outputs. So, so this assumption only, only useful in order to, to agree on a common denominations with other people. Mm -hmm. That's the that's uh -huh. the only only reason for this assumption to have, and from from their own what denominations are going to to be. Um, so anyway, every single user agreed on the same set of denominations, and this assumption is is only does that. So how they are decomposing with those sets of denominations, I'm I don't know. Uh, that's 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 not relevant for for the assumption. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, and then so this this frequency table, um, if if you have the same list of inputs, uh, and you have the same method of decomposing them, right? So every coin mm -hmm. by itself and no groups, um, then you then everyone results in the same frequency table, mm -hmm. right? Of how many output coins show up if you would decompose those input coins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And this is, so why, why is this important uh, for the coin join, for, for a high quality coin join? Well, we want to select the denominations 
those are like gonna result in the least number of outputs to be created. So because if we just go with the single denomination system with no frequency table, then it's going to create 10 times more outputs than, than, than a more sophisticated method would do. Just as a thought exercise, the best possible mix is the largest common divisor. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and that if, okay, here is a list of inputs and the best mix would be that if we would find the largest common divisor and break down every single input into, into that mm -hmm. amount. And that would be like a perfect mix. It would, it would create like 10,000 outputs or even more, but, but every single output would be equal. Mm -hmm. So we have unequal amounts on the input side, but only equal amounts on the output side. Yeah, mm -hmm. e exactly. That's what the, the largest common divisor mixing strategy mm -hmm. would, would do. Yeah, so this, of course, optimizes for anonymity set. Yes, yes. But it comes at a compromise of block space. Yes, exactly. And that's our constraint. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So then uh, the largest common divisor is not a good strategy. Let's go a bit more into how we did it with zero link, with our, with our zero link implementation. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so in, in zero link, we didn't have much of a choice <laughs> we, because, because in zero link the Chomi and coin join uh, limits us completely like what we can do. What we can do is we can have uh, around 10 denomination systems and uh, 10 denominations mm -hmm. and, and that's about it. That's, mm -hmm. that's what we can do. So that's not, that's not great, right? Yes. Um, and so this is where Wabi Sabi comes in, right? We, we now can create uh, arbitrary denominations easily and privately, or we can coordinate them. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, this means now, because we have the freedom in, in how we coordinate the coin join, now we, well, we're unconstrained on how we actually organize these amounts, right? And that's, that's where all this research comes in now. Um, but uh, why does the, the decomposing from the bottom up, how we do it in Wasabi 1.0? Um, did you compare this to, to the data set and how did it play out compared to the common divisor, for example? I might not have been clear, but when I was talking about the simulation, then I said that the first simulation that we done was Wasabi 1.2. And from there on, we, we, we always tweaked a little bit, tweaked a little bit, tweaked a little bit, and, and we ended up something much better. And so what was the uh, kind of success or failure in that tweaking mechanism? So uh, what was what were you looking at that made you say, OK, this is better than the previous or this is worse than the previous? Mm -hmm. So oh, what, what was the, the result? Uh, OK, so so very often when you make a tweak, you can see the inflation of of outputs. Mm -hmm. And then you can just say, ah, okay, then that's not a good tweak. Yeah. <laughs> tweak, tweak the other direction or <laughs> something. Um, so here, what do you mean with, with fan out or explosion of output set is that, let's say you have maybe a hundred inputs um, and all of a sudden you have 500 outputs. Right? Yeah. If, if you do that frequently uh, and, and you remix, right? Because then you have five coin joins, each a hundred in the second round, and then that explodes by a factor of five. Right, that gets exponential really quick. Uh, so if we would have a decomposition mechanism that always inflates uh, or always increases fewer inputs into more outputs, um, that would get way too expensive very, very quickly. Oh, I just wanted to say that the inflation of the outputs, that's a trivial example, but there are two, I think, more exciting examples here, which is, which is regarding privacy. So, so first, because it, these are simulations, we are able to create oh, to, to create a, an anonymity metric and basically score the whole mix that how well it did in how much anonymity it delivered. Yes. So, so and that is because in the simulation, we can just assign randomly that these, this user controls these coins and these output addresses. And because we control all users, because this is on rec test, 
um, we can do what we want, right? And, mm -hmm. and we actually see exactly which user got which coins and the siblings in that denomination, uh, who belong to them or, or which users belong to them and how many different users are there actually. So, so, so this, uh, this, is, this is interesting from the point of view that then you would think that, hey, okay, so there is only two, two variables here. The, the cost, how, how, how expensive it is to do it, and and uh, the anonymity metric, how much anonymity you deliver, right? You could just just optimize for that. Mm -hmm. And then I created a metric that calculates the cost into it, and then I realized that it cannot be done without knowing the network fees. But, but never mind, I, uh, that, that's, that's, that's one of the things we were looking at that, hey, okay, so how does the cost go up in terms of number of outputs? And how does the, the anonymity to go up? Mm -hmm. So there is a third variable which also has to do with anonymity, and that is the minimum anonymity um, gained in a single coin join. So basically, how many changes that coin join generate? So. Even though the privacy metric is basically perfect in maximizing the privacy and the output number of outputs is perfect in judging the, the costs, there is a third, third privacy variable here is that we should actually minimize the number of non-equal outputs, the number of changes. Yeah, and, and this is on the other side <laughs> of the extreme, right? Because so one side of the extreme is everyone just creates one set outputs. Right. Um, but the other extreme is we just have one standard denomination, let's say exactly 1.0 Bitcoin, and then everyone gets arbitrary amount change. Right. So you put 2.5 Bitcoin in, you get one Bitcoin equal amount and 1.5 Bitcoin change. Uh, then, of course, the 1.5 Bitcoin change can be linked back to your input. Right. That's very similar how the very first iteration of Wasabi Zero Link worked. Right, just one standard denomination and the rest is change. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing is this reduces the number of outputs greatly because you have at most two outputs, right? Your, your equal amount and your change. Um, so this is very block space efficient um, and you get some privacy uh, block space efficiently, right? So this is the other side of the extreme. And now we're kind of trying to find something that is reasonable on both sides of, of the bound, right? Something that um, creates, uh, uh, th that doesn't create too many outputs, right? But where every output that is created has at least some ambiguity. Right? And if, if we have that, then that is a perfect mix in the sense of that the entire <coughs> input value got decomposed into some ambiguity outputs. Some might have more anonymity set, right? There might be a output denomination that has 15 equal denominations, and there might be one that has three uh, equal outputs. Right? Um, and, uh, but at least something, right? and, and that is great. Yeah, and, and one interesting thing with, with the simulation is, um, so far we only explained how we got fresh input into the simulation, uh, fresh Bitcoin inputs, right? So those coins that have previously not been mixed. Uh, but with any coin join implementation, there are remixes, right? So you're going to spend in the output of a coin join uh, transaction as the input of a new coin join transaction, right? You remix your coins. Um, how did that get introduced into the uh, um, simulation? It's, um, it, it was interesting too, because Okay, so, so, so what we feeded the simulation with is real coin join Wasabi wallet inputs. Those have never been mixed before. So that's in real world the most real numbers that we are going to get. So we are not doing random numbers. We actually collected a sample and, 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 and used, used that. Okay, so, so we, we were getting X number of inputs out of those that sample randomly and then I, the simulation does one mix and then takes the results of the first mix 30% of them and gets new new inputs from the, the fresh inputs fresh Bitcoin inputs. yeah from the sample and, and, and puts them together <clears throat> and it's 30% because we measured that in Wasabi 1.2, the dumplings was measuring it, <laughs> that, uh, that it's 30% the, the remixing percentage. So, 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 so we put, took 30% of 
together and did a mix and now the result is what we are examining mm -hmm. so we basically do two mixes to simulate remixes mm -hmm. yeah so so again the 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 first simulated round is one where there are only fresh bitcoin in there and that gives us a result uh, and then we take the results of this and assume that 30 percent of those coins created get remixed uh, in a second round, so let's say we have 100 inputs in the simulation in the in the first round, so we take 100 fresh inputs, turn it into 150 outputs, uh, and then we take 30% of them and put them, uh, uh, like so 30 outputs and uh, 70 outputs from the fresh Bitcoin set, and we see how that round behaves, and then the second round is what we actually analyze. Right? So the analyzation is then, yeah, 30% remix rate, which is roughly accurate mm -hmm. um, but again it might very much change in wasabi 2.0 especially considering uh, autocoin join uh, mm -hmm. and this behavior so um, yeah so it, that's why it's a simulation <laughs> and not real world <laughs> exactly and that's why it's also very exciting now um, but so what what's the cool thing when we have all of a sudden coin join uh, standard denominations on the input side as well what happens mm. If we have only coin join standard denominations on the input side, that's, that that may, that means we are actually starting to mix on the inputs too, not only on the outputs. Um, and th that might also mean that there are more, <clears throat> there are a lot more subsets of transac possible transactions. So, so, so there could be a lot more interpretations of that coin join. That's uh, that's that's another other result. But honestly, we couldn't really measure it. But there might be some some uh, so so the anonymity sets that you you would get from Wasabi 2.0 is is much much higher in the than how much we can measure mm -hmm. because of this uh, subset sum problem. Uh, yeah, but we cannot measure that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it gets computationally uh, uh, exponential very quick. Um, uh, if someone has a lot of resource power, please analyze some, but good luck. Yeah, like infinite. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you found a, a quantum computer in a black hole, contact us. <laughs> you should be able to tell the largest input. <laughs> <laughs> You might, you might have a chance of getting the link there. <laughs> yes. uh, and again, right, so let's assume we have one unique amount on the input side, let's say 1.37. Right? Then we can decompose that into standard denominations on the output side, let's say 1 Bitcoin and 0.7 Bitcoin and 0.3 Bitcoin or whatever. Um, and let's assume that all of these outputs then have 3 or 5 or 10 different outputs, right? Now it becomes very difficult to say which of these exact outputs in that one denomination uh, that is possible for this user, uh, which one of those does he own, right? Increasing the ambiguity uh, of which is the owner of the, the previous sets of, in the input. Um, but, you know, this is in a case where we have only one possible input um, uh, denomination, right? But what happens if we have uh, two or, or more output inputs that are exactly one Bitcoin worth? Right. Now, you don't just have to consider where this one Bitcoin got decomposed, but there's an identical sibling in the amount right, uh, that is decomposed as well. Uh, and that just increases by a lot uh, the ambiguity. It's tough mm -hmm. to analyze how much. Yeah. That's a good thing, by the way. <laughs> I, d I don't know if it's a good thing. It would be... I mean, because in the future, mm -hmm. someone is going to be able to analyze it, right? Yeah. And it would be better to know now if we have a lot more anonymity set than yeah. how much we are selling. But <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> let's sell the minimum. <laughs> and, and you know, this is interesting. This is very similar to something like RSA cryptography <laughs> that depends a lot on key length, right? So if you have a very short RSA key, uh, it is computationally feasible to, to crack that. It wasn't 30 years ago, because computers were shit back then, 
Uh, so therefore, you could get away with a much smaller key size in the past. Mm -hmm. right? but, but then as computers got m more computationally uh, better, uh, they could run more, they could brute force faster, and therefore breaking a smaller key length was more reasonable. And therefore, you had to increase the key length. That's why by now, RSA keys are like 4096 bit. Um, and it, this is somewhat similar to, to how CoinJoin works and how we can uh, prevent or, or how, how, how we can make it more difficult for, for the attacker. Right? So uh, you can have a small number of inputs right? that's like a small key size. Uh, and that introduces some ambiguity, sure. Uh, and you will need to spend at least more than a second of computer time, right? It's it's gonna be it's still gonna take you a day mm -hmm. or a week or something, but you can get to something, right? Um, it would be interesting to try to brute force our current testnet coin joints, by the way, uh, the, the, those that are rather small. Um, and then, uh, but then as uh, the user increases, more specifically the input count, right? Th that is like increasing the the key length, right? It it makes it uh, there's a lot more ambiguity. Uh, it's a lot larger search space, uh, and therefore you need to spend much, much, much more computation time to actually brute force it. Right. So um, now that's the question: What is a proper keys keys key, keys length, or what's a proper input set count um, that that is good enough for today's attack vectors? Um, and then how does that change in the future? Right. And um, is it okay if we keep, if we get around with smaller coin joints now? Does that still give us ten years of defense time, and, or uh, will that be broken quite quickly? And we actually have to increase to hundreds, two hundred, five hundred inputs, uh, and how much protection does that give us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can see the the things happening right now on the internet, and not on the internet. And wouldn't it be a problem if, if um, we, we are creating censorship resistant money with Bitcoin? So I'm, I'm the devil's advocate here. Isn't it a problem, Max, that Russia is able to use Bitcoin? And China too, and North Korea. Kim Jong Un is able to use Bitcoin Max. We want to protect people first and foremost, and uh, we want to protect the the property of people. Um, and well, yeah, it's it's a very broad topic, but I think we can influence it by building tools that make theft uh, impossible. I I think that in and of itself is a very um, it's a very worthwhile endeavor because that's a common denominator that will lead to human flourishing. Um, and so that's why these tools are important. You know how I like to, to look at it is there are two kinds of technologies. One would be that that is that's technology that that is easier to leverage by groups of people than a technology that mm -hmm. is easier to leverage by individuals. Mm -hmm. And Wasabi is a technology that is easier, that is giving privacy to individuals mm -hmm. and it gives privacy that they did not have before other than a couple of thousands of years of cash and gold, but, <laughs> 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 but they did not have before in the past 50 years. Yes. <laughs> They did so. not have before in cyberspace, at least, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and now, uh, well, power to the people rather than to groups of people. Yes, uh, th that's, tr that's true, but you know, groups of people are, again, just I individuals. And if you build tools for individuals, then groups of individuals can use the tools too, mm. right? Whereas if you build group uh, tools for groups, then individuals alone cannot use it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, uh, uh, therefore, I think if, if you build tools for individuals, that's a much more inclusive approach. Right? You, you actually enable everyone to partake in the system, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. those with a lot of capital who tends to be groups, because if you pool your capital, you get more of it. Uh -huh. that's, a, 
that's a good good point uh then i wasn't clear enough because i didn't mean by what's your your goal of of building it like who are you building it to i meant more like 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 okay there are two two technologies one is the armor and one is the gun powder mm-hmm. gun guns okay the armor the knights knights were in an armor and ve- very very expensive armor but it can kill 10 villager before before the villager can even touch the the knight mm-hmm. right so aristocracy got, got raised raised because we had a very expensive technology that well an expensive technology okay and about the gunpowder is that it become very cheap and now the knight can come but the villagers have the guns and it's very easy to teach the villager to to just to use a gun uh, becoming a knight takes many many years and and a lot more money and and time and um, Th- there is some uh, there's some interesting nuance here right because so what what the what armor did proper full plate armor uh, improved defense but at a very high cost right um, and then the gunpowder decreased the cost of attack while increasing the the potency of the attack right uh, or in other words it decreased the defense um, that was so expensive right because the uh, the steel cannot stop a bullet right so we the the technology got cheaper the technology of attack got cheaper it's interesting uh-huh. and it and it got better so that the previous defense that was already very expensive was insufficient so you have a very expensive technology can that can only be acquired by aristocrats basically um uh, that that fails right and mm-hmm. that's th- that's where incentives are are so crucial right and i think the, the cypherpunks realized that um, uh, with with encryption, right? The entire game is to have it. Th- the cost of creating a public key, uh, uh, sorry, a private key, is is trivial, right? Just flip coins. That's it. And then calculating a public key out of the private key is easy, or calculating a signature from the uh, uh, private key, or verifying that signature. Right? All of these things are very easy. That the cost of using these defensive tools is very very low. Whereas then the cost of attacking the tools, if you only have the public key, trying to find the private key or to f- trying to make a signature without having the private key, right? Sure, it's possible, you know, if you have a quantum computer in a black hole, maybe, <laughs> but um, it, it's, it's uh, extremely, extremely, extremely expensive, right? So the cost of defense got way reduced, whereas the cost of attack to sufficiently, a, 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 the cost of an attack sufficiently good to overcome the defenses increased exponentially too, right? And that's the ethos of the cypherpunks. Uh, and and that's also the core ethos of Bitcoin and uh, Wasabi. Uh huh. Uh-huh. And hmm, okay, the defense and attack. That's a very good good point. That hey, the armor is a defensive technology, and uh, the gun is a the gunpowder is a is an offensive one. Mm-hmm. Um, and still, the gunpowder led to the armor led to the rise rise of aristocracy and the gunpowder led to the fall of aristocracy so what the heck is going on here it's it's the offensive one (laughs) and it's interesting how this might apply to bitcoin because let's take the thought experiment where it becomes just incredibly incredibly expensive to buy bitcoin uh, and to spend it right let's assume transaction fees are at million satoshis Mm. per bbyte right Uh, all of a sudden using this defensive tool of bitcoin is extremely expensive so only the rich can use it Right. Ergo, oh, that's it's interesting. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting idea. I didn't think of that. So, so that would actually lead to a rise of the aristocrats being, I, I mean, being invincible. Yes, but only if we if we we fail to scale Bitcoin. That's it. Right. Which that's is a possibility at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, very much. We've gracefully failed to scale for for many years now, <laughs> um, but. Uh, like it's it's possible, right? It's it's at least a amiable goal that mm-hmm. we strive towards, and that's again to tie that back to earlier why saving on block space for coin join ceremonies is just so absolutely important. Mm-hmm. Because if we don't have that, Bitcoin gets extremely expensive to use privately, and then again, only the rich will have the privacy. And the crazy thing is, right? This is invincible armor, 
Right? Bitcoin cryptography and its cryptodynamic systems are really secure. Wabi Sabi coin joints can be hopefully really secure, right? So um, there is no gunpowder technology. There is no cheap aggress uh, um, uh, aggressive technology that can be used to to overcome those people who have uh, who have those defenses. Right? The gunpowder is missing, at least for now. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because people think of anonymity as something bad sometimes some people but on the other hand if you think about it it's it's just a defensive technology yes it's not an offensive one it's a defensive yes. one it's and choosing still, what not to say to yeah. someone the, i i i i cannot understand how choosing what not to say mm -hmm. can be termed as aggressive right? at yeah. most it is like this is a de-escalation and right? to stay quiet is usually a de-escalation anonymity is a de-escalation mm -hmm. yes that's what, that's what we need, the escalation. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, because the, so there's this concept of the OODA loop, right? You observe, you orient, you decide, and you act. Okay. Right? This is a, a method, not just for you know, okay. your psychology, it's, it's also a method for warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. and so the first act that you always have to do is to observe. Right? If, if you don't observe something, you cannot act upon it. Right? If you don't know that something happens, um, if I don't see the glass of water, I can't decide if I want to drink it or not, right? So you, you observe uh, and then you orient yourself in this world. Like, what is the world around you and where are you in it? And, and how are you capable of changing this Did you exactly? observe this? <laughs> you, you observed me. <laughs> you, you oriented yourself next to me, perfectly in reach to punch me. Uh, and then you, you decided that <laughs> punching would be a funny enough joke uh, to, to quench my wrath that I won't punch back. Uh. <laughs> and then you acted, right? But the, the crazy thing is if there would have been a wall and you would not have seen me, you would not be able to observe me, uh -huh, right? uh -huh. the, and you wouldn't be able to orient how you can uh, impact me. Yeah, um, I guess even just feeling the punch is an observation, right? That, hey, a punch happened. Yes, and and now the thing is, if I would, so the sooner I, I interrupt your OODA loop, um, the better, right? So I could go at the very last step. You've already decided that you want to punch me, and, mm. and now I try to defend you in the act, for example. But that's difficult because you're already trying to punch me. Right? I can defend myself before you make the decision, right? So you've seen me, you know that I'm next to you, <laughs> but you have not yet decided to punch me and I start running away. Right? Mm. That's, a, that's a reasonable defense. Okay. Right? But even better would be if you've observed me, right? but you might not orient, you might not have oriented or categorized what this is. So uh, like you see someone walking around outside with a hood over his face. You've, you've seen that someone is there, but you don't yet know who it is and how you relate to him. And right? so you failed in the, in the orientation step. Right? So uh, this is why, for example, if you have encrypted messages, right? that's you, you fail in the orientation. You observe that someone is messaging here, you see some ciphertext moving, but you fail to orient the, the meaning of the information that is being purveyed. Right? And if you break here, that's great too, right? That's pseudonymity uh, upon others, right? You, you know someone is doing something, but you can attribute it to them. Um, but of course, the best thing is you cut out the attack before the observation. Right? The other, you, the attacker, so the attacker does not even observe you, right? If, if uh, you know, you're, you're not in your home and I walk in your home and steal your TV, you haven't observed that I was there. So what are you mm. going to do about it? Right? Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. or, or in other words, you know, if someone is living out in the woods, um, you know, how are you going to tax him? You know, the, he's, you don't even know that he lives there, right? Um, uh, yeah. And here again, this is why anonymity and privacy is, is such a cheap technology because it de-escalates at the most earliest convenience, right? It's not running away from mm. someone who is already trying to punch you. That's expensive and mm. risky. That's super risky, right? If you can hide the crazy person from the crazy person so that he doesn't <coughs> even see you, right? that's way cheaper and way less risky. Wow, okay. So um, I'm learning today. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, it's... Um, it's, it's basically anonymity is, is, is a prevention of conflict. Mm -hmm. It's like the last, last thing that you can have a conflict while going, observing something towards a coin join, but you get into the coin join and your conflict is gone. That's, 
you can't do anything about that anymore. So that's perfect the escalation of the situation. Yes, yes. Mm. So, or in other words, um, a, a coin join reduces the liability uh, of, of holding money with a transaction history. Right, because holding money with a transaction history is mm. a liability yes. because because someone has observed you and yes. someone can attribute um, uh, certain actions to this transaction of yours. Right, um, so therefore, if we would have a way to um, to remove that attribution of who owns what um, a, and where do you spend it to, right? We we step into the UDA loop much earlier. All of a sudden, you no longer know who's paying whom, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then you don't know who is the richest. Right, and whom it's profitable to steal from. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, wanna wrap it up? See you on the next one.